Good morning, this is David Ball here again in our Asaksa shop with the next episode in the Great Wave production series. Thank you for your patience while this one has been in preparation. As you've probably guessed, the video segment you have just seen was not taken here in Asaksa, but back in my home workshop in Ome, a suburb about two hours away from here by train. It's where I have lived for the past 15 years or so, but to which I am now able to return about once a week or so at best. In most of these videos, you have seen me sitting at my carving bench here in Asaksa, but as I have no printing bench here, I had to go back to Ome a few days ago, taking the finished block with me to do the first proof printing there. As you saw, after washing off the remains of the tracing, I splashed the block with blue pigment and took the first impression. I didn't use expensive Japanese paper for this. At this point, I just need to inspect the lines to get an overall impression of how the carving has gone. I will then use that sheet as a guide for making adjustments here and there to the work before moving on to the stage of preparing color blocks. We'll see that color block preparation in a couple of minutes, but before we do, I have to insert a small bit of video that I took at the final stage of carving on the key block before I went back to Ome. The block was still not covered with pigment at that time. Many weeks ago, I showed you a comparison between some of the old versions of this print and a modern version currently on sale here in Tokyo. As I moved forward with my carving, I discovered that there was yet another large difference between those old versions and the new one. Look at these enlargements. Here's the new one. It's all sharp and clean lines. But look at the older print, and all the older versions show the same feature. We see that the edges of each blue patch are carved and printed in a more fuzzy way, giving a completely different effect to the depiction of the moving water. This was done by shaving and sloping the edges of the cut wood in those places. It's called itabokashi, block gradation in Japanese. And it's far more difficult to print properly, and it seems that this is just something that has fallen by the wayside in the modern versions. But having come this far with this project, we're not about to let something like this slip through, so I got my knife out and worked on roughening up all those edges on the key block. Here's a bit of video I took along the way. So with the key block now basically ready to go, it's time to begin preparing the color blocks. This is actually a fairly simple print in structure and it won't need all that many. I think that in addition to the key block, we'll be using both sides of three other pieces of wood. The process is pretty straightforward and let me give you a rundown while you see video of the various steps. Here we go. The paper used for making color transfers has to, of course, be very stable. If it was stretching or shrinking, or the color blocks wouldn't match the key block. So I use a very thin, gumpy paper, which will carry the image itself, and I laminate this with a spray glue. You can see this happening here. I laminate them together, so we've got a backing sheet and a sheet that will carry the image. This is really a critical part of the process and I wouldn't delegate this to anybody else at all. And if this was slightly misregistered, again, the color blocks wouldn't match. It'd be endless trouble at printing time. It uh, doesn't look very pretty at this stage, but uh, that's not the goal. <laughs> 
we make one sheet for each color that's expected in the final print. And then as you see here, I color in. Uh, the yellow color means nothing. I'm just marking the zones. We color in the places that will be needed for that particular block. It's very easy to make mistakes on these, and actually the modern print that I've been using in these comparisons has one of those little circular areas missing on the sky block, and it was put into the wave area by mistake. You have to be very careful to try and catch every little place. Double check before we go on to the carving stage. There are areas in the print that aren't bounded by key block lines, and for those, the only way to get them is to trace from another copy of the print. So I'm using my light table here with a bright light shining up to the print and I'm tracing the specific spots that are required. And once all the tracing sheets are finished, it's time of course to select some pieces of wood and to get ready to paste these down. I then cut registration marks on each of the blank blocks in the same fashion as the ones on the key block. Uh, an L mark in the lower right hand corner, as you see me cutting here. and a corresponding mark on the left-hand side of the block. It doesn't need an L at this place. It's just for the paper to rest against to verify the position. Once all the sheets are ready and all the blocks are prepared to receive them, it's time to mate them up and paste them down. This is another part of the job that's reserved only for the most experienced people because if there's any screw-ups while this is being pasted down, distorted or twisted at all, the resulting color blocks again would be uh, useless. This next part is always fun, pulling off the backing sheet to show the ready, block ready to carve. It's not quite ready to carve yet though because as thin as that paper is, we can thin it down a bit more. And with a moistened finger, and the paper still wet from the glue as well, we peel away very, very carefully and pull away the back layer of paper, leaving the lines even more visible. And this also is a very critical job. Rub just a little bit too hard and those lines move in the glue and the blocks again will be no good, no match. And finally, ready for carving. So there we are, the set of color blocks is now ready to go and I'll be getting busy on that work later this afternoon. It's time for the traditional ending scene for our video. But before we go outside, I have a request to make of you. You will need headphones or earbuds to experience this segment properly because I've recorded it in a special surround sound. And if you listen with normal speakers, the effect will be completely lost. <coughs> Excuse me. There's no time for a long explanation. Now, I'll put some comments about this in the description of this video on the YouTube page. But here's an outline of what I did. These things you see in my ears at the moment are not headphones, but microphones. I have one in each ear. I wore these, plugged them into my handicam, then held it in front of me when I walked up to Sensoji Temple early yesterday morning. What you'll see is not an exciting video. Nothing really much happens, but as long as you are wearing nice headphones, left in left and right in right, you'll feel as though you are right here in Asakusa with me, strolling by with the birds and the morning strollers all around us. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much and see you next time.